How many know that God is so good, church? Hey, good to see you. Good morning. My name is Basilio. I get to be one of the pastors. If you're watching online, thank you for being with us. Turn to somebody and say, God is so good. Turn to somebody else and say, God is too good. Hey, would you stand to your feet as we declare that when we serve him, when we trust and obey, he comes through. This goes like this. Church, would you lift up your voices as we sing? When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He should call our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey, not a person. Please have a seat. Welcome to Lighthouse. We're so glad you're here with us today. We especially welcome our visitors and invite you to fill out a guest card that you'll find in the chair pocket in front of you, and you can exchange that for a gift bag at the front desk before you leave today. But to everybody, I want to welcome you to the last Sunday. The last Sunday for what? The last Sunday you will ever see these green chairs again. Some are clapping, some are booing. <laughs> they have done us well for 18 years, so thank you for that. But it's time we have a churches that want them, that are coming this afternoon to get some of them, and the rest tomorrow. And as soon as the services are over today at noon, we'll be stacking these and getting them ready to move out. And the new ones are scheduled coming 10 o'clock a.m. Tuesday morning. And so we look forward to the new chairs coming in, and I want to thank every single person that donated from home or from here. Many, many people made this possible. We did it without the property closing, as did many other projects. Speaking of which, the new baptistry is in. It is not filled yet, so it is a dry baptistry. If we have any baptisms, we'll take care of them this week. 
but it is in and uh, will be completed hopefully before next Sunday. The new roof was sprayed on and is in. That was a major project. Gets us another 20 years to our roof and will seal us from future rains and leaks, so we're thankful for that. The new playground is supposed to be complete by the end of this week before next Sunday. It's already started and should go in. The poles are in, the hardware is now in, the poles have been painted, the new giant shade sail should be in before next Sunday, and that'll be another nice addition. So many things are in the works, we're rushing to get things done before Easter as much as we can, and so far everything's on track, and so we just are very thankful. God has helped us so much. <clears throat> But you know, God doesn't just open the sky and dump things down. He works through his people. And you guys have been amazing to work with over the past several years, getting through the pandemic, getting needed things done. And they would have started the grading for the back road and the parking paving, but it would have shut everything down for about 10 weeks. And we didn't want that to start till after Easter. So the day after Easter, it starts. So that's another big project going in. So in case you're wondering, that's what's going on and I'd be happy to give you more details. Let's take a quick look at our announcements because we do have some things to share with you of importance to the congregation today. Next Sunday is the Lighthouse Basics 101 class that got rescheduled, so if you didn't get a chance to take it yet, now's your opportunity. It starts at noon with a free pizza lunch, then class is from 12.30 to 2. That's 90 minutes with me to talk about our basic beliefs and practices, why we do things the way we do, and how you can get connected here. You can sign up on the response form on the back of your program and tear that off and put it in an offering envelope, excuse me, an offering bucket. And everything is free. The, the lunch is free, the class is free, and the child care during the class is free. We'd love to have you attend with us next Sunday right after church. All right, a couple other things I want to mention. The uh, sanctuary chair volunteers, we do need help stacking the chairs. You may think, well, I can't stack a chair, but you can remove Bibles, pencils, papers. There's lots of things that people can do, so show up at noon to help us if you can. Uh, we hope to knock it out in an hour. Tomorrow at 10 a.m., a church is coming to pick up the rest of these chairs, if anyone wants to help with that. And then Tuesday at 10 a.m., we have a forklift rented and other equipment to bring in 485 new chairs into the sanctuary, classrooms, offices, and cry room. We'll need lots of help with that, and then to put the Bibles back and the papers back. So if you're available Tuesday at 10 a.m. or even tomorrow at 10 a.m., come over and help us, and we'll have something for you to do. Service surveys are in your program today. Uh, by the way, if you're going to help with the chairs, there is a green insert. It would help us if you fill that out and let us know when you're coming so we know how many to expect. Service surveys in your program, we've been talking about this for several weeks. If you haven't had a chance to fill it out yet, these are all the areas of ministry going on in the church. So please mark a D if you're already doing next to the ones you're doing and a W next to the ones you might be willing to do. If everyone did one thing, no one would have to do three or four things. So we ask your help, many hands make light work and here's ways for you to serve and be involved. Easter flowers, there's an envelope for that, and you can read the details about how you can uh, donate uh, azaleas or Easter lilies in honor or memory of a loved one, and then take them home with you after the Easter services on Easter Sunday. And then the community Easter egg hunt is coming up very soon. We need lots more volunteers. We have some. We need many more. There's an insert on that on how you can help as a volunteer. It's just from 10 to noon on Saturday, April the 16th. And then there's a pink insert with the items needed to fill those 5,000 Easter eggs. So if you can help with any item donations, that's what we need and how. So many exciting things going on right now at Lighthouse that God is doing. Let's join him in his work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to impact so many other lives, including in our community, including people that will be on this property in a little over a month that do not attend here and whose children are not involved. And we pray, Lord, this will be an outreach opportunity for many to get involved and get connected to you and to your church and for their children to grow up with Christian biblical teachings. And so, Lord, we pray for these efforts to make a difference in people's lives. And we pray today that this service will make a difference 
in our life as we seek to follow you more closely. May you bless this time together. May we honor and bless you with our worship. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome everyone around you. Give them a smile, a welcome, a wave. So good to see all of you, and if you're watching online, thank you for being here. I can't believe we've made it through March, already starting April. Time flies by so fast. Would you stand to your feet? And as we continue worshiping, we say, Father, I am yours. Use me as you see best. This song goes like this. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice.
with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there Church, will you welcome our adult choir this morning with a round of applause. Every Thursday at 5.30 p.m., we're meeting in room 11. That's right across there. And I get to lead this amazing group um, of vocalists. And so it's been a real privilege as we head into another year of ministry here. Uh, God is so good, and this team of ministers is so good. Shocking time in heaven, salvation has been brought down. 
I just wish they'd get more excited. But other than that, it was very good. Thank you guys, that was rousing, very nice. Well, some final instructions were left by an elderly woman who passed away. Having ne never married in her life, she left instructions she wanted no male pallbearers. In her handwritten instructions for her memorial service, she wrote, they wouldn't take me out when I was alive and I don't want them to take me out when I'm dead. <laughs> well, that's pretty clear. <clears throat> Today we're going to hear some final instructions as we continue to focus on Jesus and the Gospel of John. Jesus leaves his disciples both then and now with some pretty clear final instructions. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15, we're going to look at that. If you were about to leave this world... What would your final instructions to your followers be? Let's see what Jesus's are by looking at John chapter 15 and a part of chapter 16 today, starting on page 1676 in a church Bible, 1676. We are still in the long, rough night that began in John chapter 13, and it lasts for six chapters in the Gospel of John, one night, all the way into chapter 18. Here we are in chapter 15, and we will start with the seventh and final of the great I am statements that Jesus gives in the Gospel of John. Jesus has already declared, I am the bread of life. Say them with me. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. Last week he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And today we'll hear him say, I am the true vine. He begins in John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes or cleans so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Let's pause. The nation of Israel was the vine that God had planted in the land of Canaan. And his people were called his vineyard throughout the Old Testament. But they did not produce the fruit that God intended. So now Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches. Some must be pruned or cleaned to make them more fruitful, and some must be cut off that do not bear fruit. By the way, that might be a reference to Judas Iscariot, because back in chapter 13, Jesus clearly referred to him as being unclean among the others. So in keeping with this vine imagery, which was very common in a land of vineyards, this first instruction that Jesus leaves with his followers is this, remain in me. Look at it. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you do what? Remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you've ever done a navigator's course, that is a memory verse from the navigators and I believe also in experiencing God. This word remain is an important one because it appears 11 times in this chapter. It means to stay or to live or to continue and not depart, in this case from the main vine, which is Jesus. He is the main vine. We are the branches. We must remain in him if we are to bear fruit, for apart from him we can do what? Nothing. Nothing, Nothing of kingdom value, which is why he continues in verse 6 and following, where he says, if you do not remain in me, 
You are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Again, let's pause. There are great losses, he says, if we don't remain in him, and there are great blessings if we do. He promises that we will bear much fruit if we stay closely connected to him, and that this also glorifies our Father in heaven, and it also proves that we are really following him as his disciples. In addition, he says, if we remain in him, and if his words remain in us, He promises to grant our requests through answered prayer, just as he promised back in chapter 14. Whatever we ask that's in his will, but we must remain in him or else we're just a fruitless branch that quickly withers. Are you staying connected to Jesus Christ? Are you remaining in him? Isn't that why you're with us today? to draw closer to him through worship, to draw closer to him through his word, to draw closer to him through communion, to draw closer to him through prayer. As our church sign says at our entrance, the closer to Christ, the more fruit we bear, the more we glorify God. Would you say that with me? The closer to Christ, the more fruit we bear, the more we glorify God. That's so simple and yet so profound. Are you bearing fruit for the Lord's kingdom? Well, what does that mean to bear fruit? Well, it might refer to acts of service, as it often does in Scripture, things that we do to strengthen the Lord's work on earth, whether in the church, where there's plenty of opportunities to serve him and one another, or to serve him out in the community, Or it could also mean to share our faith with others that eventually leads to a harvest. That's definitely bearing fruit. But you know, it also includes bearing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Letting the Holy Spirit produce in us love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. These are character virtues that God wants to produce in us because they are his character. He wants to reproduce his character in us. And when we yield to the Holy Spirit, he will bear that fruit in us. We don't become more loving or more patient by trying harder. You ever try harder to be patient? (laughs) You ever pray for patience? Don't. If I had a nickel for every time something went wrong, somebody said, well, maybe the Lord's just trying to teach you patience. (laughs) I'd have a lot of nickels. But growing in these character virtues produces good fruit for the Lord's vineyard. He can use that. Speaking of love, which is the first one, in verse 9, Jesus continues, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. By the way, Jesus had to have joy or he wouldn't have attracted children to him or uh, pagans to him, people who are lost to him. People were drawn to him. People are drawn to people with joy, and he wants his joy to be in you and in me. God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son. Jesus loved us so much that he laid down his life for us. We have all received so much love already from God, and now Jesus tells us to remain in that love. The love of Christ is so compelling, so amazing, and so fulfilling, why would we ever leave it? Well, because we live in a world that's opposed to God, we get distracted from the love of God. We easily get distracted by the things of this world. We so easily fall away. 
That's why Jesus uses this vine imagery. If you've ever cut part of a vine off, you know how quickly the branch withers. Yesterday, this was a healthy grapevine. Yesterday, this had great potential to produce good fruit. It doesn't look so great today. I didn't do anything to it. In fact, when I received it yesterday, I tried to put in a little bit of water because it was so wilted already, I didn't know if it'd make it till today. I thought it'd just disintegrate and disappear off the face of the earth. I'd reach for it and pull up and it'd be just a stalk and no leaves. This is a healthy grapevine yesterday, and today, it's not only dying, it's dead. This isn't going to produce anything. And Jesus uses this common vineyard illustration that everyone in his day would have understood to say, this is what happens if you get disconnected from me, he's saying. You get disconnected from Jesus, you begin to wilt, you begin to suffer, you quickly die. We have no spiritual life of our own except what we draw from being connected to Jesus. Just as the branch has no life of its own except what it draws from the life of the vine. Without him, we quickly begin to wither and die. Jesus knew our tendency to drift, to separate from him due to the distractions and the temptations of this world. So he instructs us to remain in him, to remain in his love. Then he says you'll have a healthy fruitful life. Then you will keep his commands, he says, and lead a more obedient life. Then we will have joy in us, and our joy will be complete. More on that in a moment. But meditate on this before we move along. Jesus, the Lord of the universe, wants you not only to come to him, he wants you to stay close to him. He wants you to remain in him. He wants you to remain in his love for the rest of your life into eternity. Isn't that an awesome invitation? That's not a harsh command. It's the most loving invitation you could imagine. Then he gives his disciples a second instruction, to love each other, one of his key teachings. Look at verse 12 and following. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And then look in verse 17. This is my command. Love each other. And not just to love each other, but he said to love each other as he has loved us. And how did he love us? Unselfishly, sacrificially, totally, He laid down his life for us. He even calls us his friends, especially if we do what he commands. In verse 15, he says he no longer calls us servants, but now he calls us friends. He says, servants don't know what their master's up to, but I've revealed everything my father has given me to tell you. So now we know God's plans for us, and we've been invited to join him as friends. I'll be honest, I don't know if we ever love anyone as much as we love ourselves or as much as Christ has loved us. But that's what our instruction is from our master. And how can we be commanded to love each other? Love each other! Right now, love each other! How can you command someone to do what we're taught is a feeling? Because agape is not a feeling, it's a decision. It is a decision to treat others the way that Christ has treated us. It's choosing, and the more we remain in Christ and the more we remain in his love, the more it influences how we love each other. This is in contrast to a world that honestly is filled with hatred. In verse 18 and following, Jesus says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. I love this next line. As it is, you do not belong to the world you have a Bible of your own, underline that. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. 
Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. Well, when did he tell us that? Back in John chapter 13, verse 16, he said, Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Which is why he now says in chapter 15, if you look at verse 20, If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. We do not belong to the world. That's why we're never going to feel totally at home here. That's why its ways, its practices are always going to seem unusual, odd, even offensive to us. It's a different system. We can't expect any better acceptance or treatment from the world as Christians than they gave Christ, which wasn't very good at all. The kingdoms of this world are often fueled by hatred. The kingdom of Christ is fueled by love. It's a very different system. Decent people are appalled at the cruelty in Ukraine. Attacking unarmed civilians standing in a bread line. Attacking children who are there for treatment in hospitals. Attacking families that are trying to evacuate. Hatred is ugly, but love is beautiful, like the people who are helping these people, like the people who are putting their own lives on the line to bring them supplies, like the people who are taking them into their own homes in neighboring countries. May people be amazed at our love for each other. Jesus said in a previous chapter, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. An early church leader by the name of Tertullian said that pagans were struck by the love of the early church. They said, look how they love one another, for they themselves hate one another, and how they are ready to die for each other, for they themselves are readier to kill each other. May the people around us say, look how they love each other. Every time we help another, forgive another, pray for another, show love to another. You know, the Apostle John who wrote this gospel was so moved by the central teaching of Christ that it permeated the letters he later wrote, First and Second John especially. In 1 John 4, 10 and 11, he wrote, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So may this teaching of love and the example of Christ now permeate our lives and how we think and act. Well, let's move down to verse 26 and 27, where next Jesus instructs his disciples to testify for me. This is one of his final instructions. Again, he has carefully chosen what to leave them with, and this is one of his last instructions to them. And key to that is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Jesus says in verse 26, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. You know, last week we heard Jesus repeatedly promise in chapter 14 that he would not leave us as orphans, but that he would send his own spirit, the Holy Spirit, to live in us, to love us, to help us. And here he promises to send him again, the advocate, he calls him, the spirit of truth who will testify about Jesus to us. He will confirm Jesus in our hearts. When you read scripture, the Holy Spirit will confirm the truth of it in your heart. And then Jesus tells his disciples that they also must testify about him, for they had been with him from the beginning of his ministry. They could tell others of what they had seen and heard, about his teachings, about his example, about his death, on the cross for our sins, about his resurrection 
from the dead to eternal life. You know, at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus commands, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. At the end of Mark's gospel, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. At the end of Luke's gospel, Jesus declares, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses, he says, of these things. Near the end of John's gospel, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And at the beginning of Acts, right before Jesus ascends into heaven, he tells his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The point is that all four Gospels and the book of Acts are careful to record this final instruction of Jesus for his disciples to testify for him. And they did. First in Jerusalem, within 10 days at Pentecost, and then throughout Judea and Samaria. And then they went on to Cyprus and Ethiopia and Asia Minor, which is now Turkey, and then to Greece and to Italy and to India and to Africa and eventually to the rest of Europe and to the ends of the earth. And we are living proof of that. We would not be here today had they not followed this final instruction to testify for him. And because there are still so many souls to be saved, two-thirds of the world's population that do not call on the name of Jesus, and a growing number of not-yet-believers right here in the United States of America, Jesus still wants his disciples to testify for him to tell others what he has done for us, what we have seen, what we have heard, what we have experienced from our loving Savior and Lord. We may feel inadequate to the task, but that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Look at the next chapter. We're going to turn to chapter 16 now in verse 13. In John 16, 13, Jesus promises, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And he does. You ever read the Bible and suddenly it comes alive and you see something you've never seen before, even if you've read it many times before? Is that you just got real smart all of a sudden? <laughs> the light bulb in your head wasn't screwed all the way in and finally something happened and it, it knocked it in? And, or was it the Holy Spirit illuminating the truth of God in his word? You know, we heard in our men's study last Wednesday night how Peter and John changed after receiving the Holy Spirit so that they were called to account for how a lame man that everybody knew that had laid at the gate on the entry to the temple for many years was now healthy and walking again. And when they were brought before the very leaders that condemned Jesus to die, the Bible says when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. There's the reason. And where did they get that courage? If you look back in Acts 4, verse 8, it says that Peter was then filled with the Holy Spirit. He didn't do this on his own. He didn't have to do it on his own, and you and I don't have to testify for Jesus on our own. He will give us, through the Holy Spirit, the direction that we need. So much so that when these leaders then told Peter and John and gave them strict orders never to speak or teach in the name of Jesus again, Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. 
may the same be said of us. We can't help speaking about what we've seen and heard. We can't help but to tell other people what Jesus has done for us. We can't help but tell people all the good things we've received here among our brothers and sisters at Lighthouse Christian Church. We don't want to keep it to ourselves. We can't help but to tell other people about it. Amen? Amen. And how's that going to happen? Not by waiting until we have some kind of strange supernatural experience. Not by waiting until we take some course that teaches us some nifty technique for converting everybody you ever meet. No, but when we so yield our lives to the Holy Spirit that he gives us the courage and the opportunity and the words to testify for Jesus, we will do so. One of our own members does this every week. You know him. His name's Vigo. He goes out and he shares Jesus with everybody on his bus route, everybody he meets at the bank and at the store and in his neighborhood, even in his own family. And every week he gives us a list of all the people he shared Jesus with, asking us to pray for them that the Holy Spirit will continue to work on their heart and grow them. Now let's be honest. He has the gift of evangelism. We all have different gifts. Not everyone has the gift of evangelism. But we have all been called to be a witness for Jesus. And the only question is, will we be a good witness or will we be a bad witness? We all testify every single day to other people about the places where we've eaten and what we've watched on TV and the movies that we've seen and what we've heard on the news. We do this every day. Jesus is calling us to testify about what we've seen and heard about him, about what we've consumed in his word, and to tell others news, but good news, not all the bad news we watch on TV every day, but good news of the good things we've received from the hand of our Lord and Savior in Jesus Christ directly and through the goodness of his church. The question is, are you willing to testify The last of the final instructions that Jesus gives his disciples that night is essential for us today, and that is to have joy and peace. If we don't have joy and peace, nobody's going to listen to us. Why don't you come and join us? We have an awful lot of fun. (laughs) The rest of chapter 16 follows what Jesus says in verse 16. In John 16, 16, he says, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. Well, of course, this upsets the disciples again. We've already seen how he's been telling them this all night. Every time he says it, they get upset again. But he's trying to prepare them. So he counsels them down in verse 22. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again. And you will rejoice And no one will take away your joy. If you have a Bible, underline that. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Jesus doesn't dismiss our grief. But he does promise joy that cannot be taken away. Psalm 30, verse 5, puts it like this. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So if you're going through grief right now, and some of you are, understand this. Jesus, your Lord and Savior, wants you to have joy again. It may take time to get there, But when it comes, it will no longer be dependent on circumstances, on whether things are going well or not. But it will depend on your deepening relationship with him. And he wants to answer our prayers, whatever we ask in his name. And that gives us additional joy. Don't you get excited when God answers your prayers? Isn't it amazing to you that the God of the universe listens to you and cares about you? and answers your prayers so directly that you know he did it? Don't you want to tell other people about that? For you know what? (laughs) Without him, we can do nothing. But with him, 
We can do anything God wants us to do. Jesus does warn his disciples that their faith is going to be tested. The rest of this chapter. He tells them they're going to be scattered. They're going to desert him. And as we know, that did happen. But then they returned and were restored. You know, our faith gets tested too. But we also have been given the means to repent of our sins and to confess them to him and to be forgiven and to be restored. What does 1 John 1, 9 say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then Jesus closes not only this section, but what is the whole upper room experience that night with a great promise in John 16, 33. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Did you hear that? But take heart, literally cheer up. I have overcome the world. Jesus has already promised his disciples a joy that cannot be taken away, and now he promises them peace even in this world of trouble where he says we will have trouble. He does not promise to protect us in a bubble. He says you will have trouble. But he promises us joy because, and peace because he has overcome the world. Because he has overcome the world through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection. And because of that, we too can be overcomers. John later wrote, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that? If you do, then Jesus has some final instructions for you. Are you ready? Say them with me. Remain in me, love each other, testify for me, have joy and peace. If you don't yet believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you can. Just examine the truth and dare to believe. Then you too can be an overcomer who overcomes the world. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all your instructions in the Bible, but we especially thank you for these final ones. They are so clear. May we hear them. May we put them into practice in our own life. May we remain closely connected to you and allow nothing to pull us away. May we draw our very life from you. May we bear fruit for you. Help us to love each other unselfishly, even sacrificially, as you have loved us. May your spirit fill us and help us to testify for you so that others may know the forgiveness and the salvation and the eternal life that you've so freely given to us. Lord, produce in us, in spite of our troubles, lives so full of joy, lives so full of peace that others will want to know why so that we can point them to you. Today we thank you for Jesus. And may those yet to believe dare to trust in him, we pray in his precious name, amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, Jesus left us with some important final instructions. We invite all who have heard them today to respond somehow. For some, that might just mean it strengthens your faith and it strengthens your resolve to live these things out in your life. For others, it may mean that you come back to him, that you return to him, that you remain close to him, and that you are separated from him no longer. And for still others, that might mean you finally put your faith in him as the Son of God, and to confess Him as Savior and Lord. Would you like to do that today? If you have a decision to make, I invite you to come meet me down front during our song of response and make a response to confess Jesus as Savior and Lord and to be baptized, to recommit your life to Him, or to come and join this church family. I ask everyone 
to think hard about these final instructions and to stand with me and to celebrate the joy and the peace that he freely offers to each and every one of us. Let's stand and worship him. must be in his ears. Let's sit and commune with him right now. Good morning. Back in the 1980s, sometime around then, there was a, a consultant by the name of Stephen Covey, and he wrote some famous books, one of which was Seven Habits of Highly Successful Leaders. And those of you that read it were introduced to a term called a paradigm shift not a pair of dimes that you have in your pocket, okay? But a paradigm. Well, what we're gonna present right now was for the disciples a major paradigm shift. Because they had attended Passover throughout their lives. And now Jesus was with them and you heard all these things today and over the past few weeks leading up to the supper. Because Jesus knew where he was going. And he wanted them to be clear about everything. So during the Passover meal, Matthew tells us, he paused paradigm shift and after giving thanks he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to them and he said take and eat this is my body which is given for you and then later during the supper another paradigm shift he took the cup and after he gave thanks to God, his father, he said, take and share this among you, each and every one of you, for this is the cup of the covenant of my blood, which is poured out for many, poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sin. And then Matthew tells us after the meal, and after they sang a song, went out to the Mount of Olives. So now, we take the bread, which represents Christ's body, freely given for us.
take the cup, the fruit of the vine. Fruit of the vine, not a dead vine, but a living vine. Representative of his blood that he bled out totally, totally for us and for all of those who will come to him. Let's pray. Father, I confess a lot of times I don't understand it. I really don't. I don't get it. But you know that about me. You know that about each of us. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know where we've been and what we've done. But you also know where we're at right now and where we're going. And you spend every day of our lives molding us and shaping us and in some cases doing some hard chisel work to really shape us into the image of your son. Father, help us as we remember his sacrifice in this communion of the bread and the fruit of the vine that he gave everything for us. You gave everything for us. And help us always remember that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us today, both here and at home. Uh, when we get done with our second service today, we will begin to dissemble the chairs. So if you're part of that help, there's things you can do to remove Bibles, pencils, papers, cards, and chairs. We'll give instruction just before we conclude the second service so that it's not just utter chaos and we'll try to have a, a nice organized plan to do this. But we thank all those who can help today. If you can help tomorrow about 10 o'clock, we have a small job to do to get the rest out. And then 10 o'clock on Tuesday, the new ones come in. If you want to help with that, bringing the new ones in, setting them up, putting the Bibles back, pencils and papers back in around 11.30 or noon. But we'll start the chair work at 10 a.m. You can help us then. So we appreciate all the help that we get. Today on the patio, we have a couple opportunities to get more information about the Easter egg hunt, how you can get involved, and also a girls' night out event that you can sign up for. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining us. Basilio has some final words, and I think we have a video today. Friends, last week uh, I wanted to show a video. We went two Sundays ago to hand out care bags. Care bags are really an excuse to, to gift uh, to our homeless uh, population in, um, in Oceanside and just to start spiritual conversations. And here's just a, a piece of what happened and what your generosity and compassion did uh, for those in our community. So friends, that was just a piece of uh, kind of what we did, and uh, yeah, God is so good. Because of your prayers, your generosity, your giving, friends, so important, we're called to make disciples, 
and to, to preach the gospel and make disciples. And I praise God for this place. Praise God for all these building projects we're doing. And most importantly, I praise God for the people that will come through here. But we must go out and share the good news. And you have this great opportunity to do that. Would you stand to your feet as we finish today? Remember, as we head out, there's some black buckets in the back where you can uh, drop off your offering. If you're giving online, uh, you can do that as well. Thank you for joining us. Let's pray. God, you are good. And, Father, we thank you for all the wonderful things, Father. But most importantly, are you the people, Father God, that we would share this gospel, this hope, that we would be good witnesses, Father God, that we would lead in our homes, in our community, Father, in our neighborhoods and around the world, Father. We thank you for Lighthouse, for these, your people. Be with them as they head out. In your name we pray and God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a great day. See you next weekend. And go change the world.